Hi, everybody. JJ here with ASUS. Happy Friday. Hopefully, everybody's ending up the week on a positive and productive footing, and uh, hopefully, everybody's staying safe and staying healthy. So, uh, it's Friday, and that means, of course, we've got another PC DIY show to kick off, and we've got a good number of updates to give you guys this week in terms of some new hardware that we've got, uh, some updates for those of you, of course, that are maybe jumping into Windows 11, um, as well as also taking a look at some of your guys' awesome builds from the community as part of our PC DIY Builders Spotlight. So, as always, um, excited to be able to kick off the stream and be able to go ahead and jump into things and let you guys know what we got going on. So uh, first things first, let's go ahead and just go over some of the general announcements that we've got going on this week in terms of just um, a couple items, including one Windows 11 and then uh, also the UEFI update announcements. So uh, let me go ahead and just double check, make sure everything's looking good here, guys, and we will go ahead and get moving things along. Okay, uh, looking good here. Okay, uh, so first things first, in terms of the overall uh, UEFI updates that we've got for this week, uh, overall, no big issues in terms of, um, well, excuse me, no big updates in terms of just the UEFI releases this week. Uh, normally, in terms of updates that we have, um, we're going to have both Intel and AMD-based UEFI BIOS updates. And this week, it's very minimal, only a few number of updates. But if you are interested in finding out the specific updates that we have gone ahead and issued for Intel and AMD motherboards, make sure to go ahead and check out our PCDIY Facebook group. Uh, I'm the admin there. You can go ahead and find out the full list of the boards, along with a good breakdown of different kind of pieces of information that you want to keep in mind if you're going to update the firmware for your motherboard. As always, um, I would say that if your system is running stable without any issues, there's no need to worry about updating your UEFI. UEFI updating is generally going to be best uh, kind of suited towards users that are familiar with the benefits of updating their firmware or specifically maybe looking to improve upon a certain feature or function or compatibility concern that they might have uh, with the current UEFI firmware that they're running. Um, let me go ahead and link you guys in the group if you guys are interested in, of course, checking out those posts. Those posts are formally designated underneath our announcement section, and they all also are tagged. So it makes it really easy to find them. And I generally put them up every Friday. So I haven't put them up yet today because, like I said, uh, for today, very minimal number of releases, so nothing overall really to be worried about in that regard. Hey, Tom, uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, Erica, thanks for joining us as well. And Marco, also thanks for joining us. Uh, Tony, I'm doing good. Hopefully, you're doing good as well, man. So thanks again for joining here the stream. Happy to have you here. Hey, Marco, yes, uh, it's been maybe a little bit of time, but uh, thank you for noticing. I'm happy to, happy to have you here, man. So thanks for joining us here on the stream as well. So, oh, fantastic. Um, very cool. Happy to know that you're enjoying uh, your router. Hopefully it's an Asus router, maybe a Wi-Fi 6 router. Definitely. Uh, we've got a wide range of Wi-Fi routers, just like you can see right here with this AXE 11,000 right next to me that really do help to offer you a great experience when it comes to your connectivity, whether it's going to be wired or wireless. Uh, and I really love a lot of the features that we've got baked in there. Uh, and if actually, if any of you are interested in kind of maybe upgrading, making the jump up to Wi-Fi 6, uh, we ran actually a poll not that long ago that showed that a lot of you, in terms of your wireless, you might still be using a Wi-Fi 5 or 8 2.11 AC router from a few years ago. Um, about over 50% of our users were still in that camp. Um, we actually do have a dedicated live stream where I dive into different things that you might want to keep in mind if you're looking to upgrade to Wi-Fi 6 and also 2.5 gigabit LAN networking. Um, so it's actually archived here on our YouTube channel and our, on our Facebook channel. So you can make sure to go ahead and check out those videos if maybe you're interested in upgrading your Wi-Fi. Or if you got any questions, feel free to ask that as well. All right, guys. So um, first things first, uh, we've got the UEFI updates out of the way. Now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, Windows 11. So for many of you, of course, are aware that Windows 11 launched a little time ago, just literally uh, you know, about a week ago, approximately. And uh, there have already started to be some, uh, some updates. Um, on our part, ASUS has been really proactive at uh, looking to implement firmware or essentially UEFI BIOSes for an extensive number of our motherboards uh, to essentially be able to offer what we would call out-of-box installation compatibility. Um, the, the reason being is that there are going to be a couple of UEFI parameters that you might actually have to set to be able to install Windows 11. So again, if those of you are, that are interested in potentially making, making this update, I'm going to talk about just a couple of key points that you're going to want to keep in mind. And I will also link you to the page in question to help to kind of uh, just have, have all the information you're going to need when it comes to making an update. So uh, let me go ahead and bring up this page for you guys. Uh, we'll also go ahead and link it in the chat. So give me one moment here. Uh, give me one second to load up this page here. All right. 
So here you can see this is our Windows 11 page, and it will break down to pretty much all the information you're going to need in terms of getting ready to transition over to Windows 11. Now, it's important that I do stress that I recommend a clean installation. I don't generally recommend upgrades. While Microsoft has worked really diligently to be able to ensure, I think, a good overall upgrade experience, um, especially if you've had multiple milestone updates or essentially a number of different Windows 10 updates over a couple of years, um, that can really lead to a lot of foundational aspects that I think overall in terms of ensuring the best stability and the best overall interoperability and functionality, I do recommend clean installations. That being noted, you can see that it's broken down between Intel and AMD platforms. Just click on each one and it will guide you through the different options that you would want to keep in mind. All the motherboards that we have corresponding UEFI BIOSes that have been issued for to be able to enable Windows 11 support along with these options right here that you see. And we also do have a full guide that I've gone ahead and broken down an announcement in the PCDIY Facebook group to give you some additional insights. Now, with that being noted, there are a couple things that you do want to keep in mind. One, um, there are still no yet Windows 11 support pages for motherboards. And what I mean by that is that if you install Windows 11 right now on any of the compatible motherboards, which you saw listed on that page, um, you can essentially have it work but you're not going to have traditional drivers be available yet. And what I mean by that is that normally when you go ahead and install an operating system, you're going to need software or drivers essentially for your audio, for potentially for storage. You're going to potentially need it for the chipset, uh, for networking, for different types of devices on your system to be able to ensure that they're getting the best features and the performance. As of right now, the vast majority of those drivers are going to be what are referred to as inbox drivers. Um, I'm going to be talking actually about a number of new drivers that have been released that have been certified for Windows 11. Um, and of course, from the GPU side, both, excuse me, all three, Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA have issued Windows 11 drivers. But you will be seeing formalized support pages for Windows 11 in the coming weeks. Um, so as of right now, those are not yet live. So do keep in mind that essentially you're going to be relying on that. And also for those of you that may be running AMD platforms, as you may be aware, AMD did issue a notice to essentially let users know that they're coordinating with Microsoft to help to improve the overall performance experience for Ryzen systems. Um, it's not overall a concern like your system is going to be detrimentally not able to run or it's going to have crashes or it's going to have problems. It just means that it's not going to necessarily have the highest level of performance and they'll be forthcoming an actual update that will help to resolve this and essentially ensure that it offers parity experience along with the other improvements that Windows 11 brings uh, outside of Windows 10. So um, again, those update pages will be coming in the not too distant future, so just keep that in mind. And with that, now I also want to go ahead and give you guys a little bit of update on some of the drivers that have actually now been released. Now keep in mind, these are going to be what are referred to as direct manufacturer drivers. Similarly, if you go to download your drivers from NVIDIA or AMD directly, um, you can utilize these drivers that I'm recommending, but these have not been formally validated or qualified by ASUS. Um, some of that is important because sometimes for, let's say, like an audio driver or a networking driver, um, the drivers that we'll actually package and have available may be subtly tweaked or revised specific to the board in question. So do keep that in mind. Essentially, you're kind of loading these drivers at your own course, essentially, if you want to try these out with Windows 11. All right. Um, and uh, with that, let me just go ahead and double check, see if there's any kind of questions there. Uh, looks like we're doing good there. Hey, Derek, thanks for joining us here for the stream. OK, uh, so let me go ahead and uh, show you guys. We've got a couple of different drivers that we want to uh, go through here. So uh, first up is going to be, uh, let me see right here. Of course, NVIDIA uh, has gone ahead and issued a driver release. And this also driver release, for many of you if you're not aware, uh, does actually also include quite a number of uh, big improvements um, to offering essentially um, you know, additional image quality enhancements and performance improvements because they've expanded quite a number of games in terms of their support for DLSS. Uh, if you're not aware of what DLSS is, it's a uh, advanced kind of image related quality technology that you have that you can toggle on to really be able to have um, essentially specialized portions of the GPU look to be able to use its AI technology and upscale the picture, essentially just making it look better. Um, and it's really exciting the number of games that they've gone ahead and released this for. Um, I will link this into the chat. These are the game ready drivers. Um, and essentially all the different games that have now support for DLSS, as well as being Windows 11 ready. One thing that some of you may or may not be aware about, uh, excuse me, may or may not be aware of, is, is that there's been a shift to a new type of driver model that is called Windows DCH. Um, as part of this change, um, NVIDIA's traditional control panel is no longer directly available. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> That's my fault. Um, 
uh, the, the traditional drivers actually do no longer have your traditional control panel available to you within the operating system. You actually do need to download the control panel within um, now the Microsoft Store. It is a, a UWP package or essentially an application that you need to download. Um, if you're, you want access to that NVIDIA control panel and the features that it might offer, it's just something you need to keep in mind because it's now not traditionally installed. It's not a big issue. Um, for many users, they're generally not going into that. You can do, usually do everything that you need to do inside of the GeForce experience. But if it is something that is gonna be important to you, um, that is something that you do wanna keep in mind is that you will need to actually go through and install the actual uh, control panel um, directly from Microsoft Store, okay? So let me go ahead and link that in the chat for you guys. And I think if I have the link to the uh, to the control panel, let me double check. I might have the link to the control panel here. If I do, yep, I have it here too. Uh, so actually, I can I can show you what that looks like, guys. So give me one second, so you guys know exactly what I'm talking about here. So here you'll see this is uh, what I'm referring to. Um, you'll see that there's an NVIDIA control panel. This is actually in the Windows Store, and you would actually download it, click on it, and this will give you access to essentially your traditional NVIDIA control panel. Panel. So this is something that you will need to go ahead and download if you want access to it. So uh, just keep that in mind. Okay, and I will go ahead and, like I said, link this also in the chat for you guys if you do want access to this. All right, gone ahead and drop that in there. Hey, Kevin, happy to have you here again on the stream, man. Fantastic. Thanks so much, man. Hopefully your Friday is uh, looking good for you as well, man. Okay. So uh, we've got the NVIDIA driver. Um, Intel has also gone ahead and issued an updated uh, Windows 11 driver. This is going to be beneficial for those of you that are, of course, going to be running um, integrated graphics on Intel-based platforms. So I've gone ahead and linked that one there for you guys in the chat as well. Um, AMD is also going ahead and released um, updated set of drivers as well. And those are also linked in the chat for you guys also. Now, uh, one thing I do want to go ahead and show you guys and something that sometimes I see within the, the own PCDIY group when people are kind of asking questions about issues that they may be running into is actually always take a look at the release notes. Um, the release notes are essentially the information that's posted by the driver manufacturer. And the reason why it's important is because it will tell you fixed issues and known issues. And the important one that I actually tell a lot of times, sometimes people take a look at is known issues. You might actually find that there's maybe a direct level of information noting maybe an issue that like when you're toggling between one application to another application or from a game to a different type of game or kind of just any different number of type of scenarios that they might have already detailed and let you know this is something that they're aware of and something that they're working on. And so especially if your system was working fine and then all of a sudden you kind of notice something happened and all you did was maybe install a recent driver update, you might have been assuming that essentially everything was entirely okay, but you might have not realized that there still could actually be issues that are attempting to be resolved. So um, this is just kind of an FYI that I try to let users um, be aware of, right, is that when you're downloading that software, always take a look at the fixes and take a look at the known issues so that at least you're aware of the known problems that essentially could be occurring resonant to that, okay? Um, so that takes care of the Intel updates, the AMD updates, and there are also two other updates that I wanted to go ahead and note. So Intel has also gone ahead and released updated Windows 11 drivers specifically for their wireless controllers and for their Bluetooth. So a vast majority of our motherboards that we have um, that have come out in the last couple of years do feature Intel Wi-Fi controllers. So you can get the updated now software for Windows 11 and for Bluetooth uh, from these packages. Again, these are not formal ASUS packages. Um, so do keep that in mind. They are, have not been 100% validated, but generally I find in most situations they will generally work. But there can sometimes be differences in terms of the functionality or even the installation experience by utilizing these direct from party uh, drivers, um, with the exception of GPU drivers. GPU drivers, pretty much no problems in that regard. And there's also an updated driver um, from Realtek for the actual network controller. So let me go ahead and install, excuse me, let me link those two in the chat for you guys. So I have gone ahead and linked to both of those. All right, guys. Hey, Jay. Thanks for joining the stream. Happy to have you here. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, let me just see here. Any other quick questions that might have popped up in there? OK, we're, we are looking good, guys. OK, so let's go ahead and keep moving things along here. 
So that wraps up um, everything I wanted to kind of touch on in terms of just Windows 11 announcements. Um, so let's go ahead and now actually talk about some brand new products. So we do have actually uh, a few new products to actually talk about. Um, you know, that's the thing definitely with Asus is we've always got something that we're working on because we've got a pretty big product line. So uh, the first one I want to touch on is actually a brand new update that'll be coming up on our B50, B550 series of motherboards. So some of you might be aware we already had kind of a refresh or an update uh, for B450. Take for instance, like when we updated the ROG Strix B450-F2 uh, from version one, um, or let's say in some of the recent updates, like with the Tough Gaming series, where we updated to the Tough Gaming X572, this is gonna be very similar. So we now are gonna be having an updated version here. So let me go ahead and show you what this board is all about, guys. And, you know, really B550 is a great option for those of you that are going to be looking for a board that's going to be stable, reliable, be able to offer great performance with any Ryzen 3000 series, 5000 series CPU, still give you PCI Gen, Gen 4 support, uh, give you support for the smart access memory technology, a resizable bar, regardless of whether you're running an AMD or an NVIDIA graphics card. There's really no kind of overall uh, disadvantage. The main thing that you would want to keep in mind when you kind of are going with, let's say, a B450 based motherboard, excuse me, a B550 based motherboard, as opposed to, let's say, like an X570 motherboard, is going to be in the core features, functions, and specifications. This might come down to the, like when you look at the motherboard, an X570 motherboard might have more rear USB 3 ports on it. It might have a little bit of a higher end audio design. It might have dual LAN on it. It might have more advanced fan headers along with specialized water cooling headers. Um, we've actually got dedicated live streams that have covered in depth both B550 series as well as X570 series motherboards if you kind of want to get a better sense of which is the right board. But I'll tell you, in my experience, when I get a lot of people asking me, JJ, what's a good board in terms of, uh, you know, for me to be able to build on, you know, I don't want to spend up too much money, but I want to have something that's stable and reliable. I really do recommend B550. It's a great foundation, very reasonable in terms of the price point and overall minimal compromise. So um, here you'll see it's got a really nice, clean aesthetic. It is using a little bit of the older design language uh, as opposed to the newer design language that we've recently rolled out for our Tough Gaming series, um, but still generally monochromatic. Um, so it's going to really be able to work well in any type of build. Um, so no issues in that regard. Um, the main updates that you're going to see for this generation versus the prior generation is going to be that there's now four um, RGB headers that are on the motherboard. So two ARGB headers and two standard RGB headers. And that just essentially just means that you have more headers to be able to connect things like RGB fans, LED strips, chassis, uh, coolers, anything that utilizes your traditional either three pin or four pin RGB connections. You'll also see that the board does have two M.2 heat sinks where the prior board only had one M.2 um, heat sink. And this model also comes default with Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth on board where the prior version, you had to pick the Tough Gaming Plus Wi-Fi or non-Wi-Fi model. So there was kind of two different models to pick from depending on whether you want a wireless here, essentially by default, you're gonna get Wi-Fi. And of course this, just like any of the other motherboards is fully certified for Windows 10, Windows, excuse me, Windows 10 or Windows 11. So um, either which way you're good to go. Um, it's got a very robust solid power delivery design, large heat sinks to be able to keep the board really cool, whether you're gonna be running stock or whether you're gonna be running overclock, you don't need to worry about that. Um, you've got USB 3.0 Den 2 on the board along with USB type C connectivity on there. Like I said, Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth built on board, uh, those four RGB headers. Um, but the only thing that you might find missing potentially here uh, that you may want, depending on your build, is going to be that it doesn't have an internal Type-C header. That doesn't mean it doesn't have Type-C on the motherboard because it does have Type-C on the rear but it doesn't have it internally. If you want it internally, take a look at the Tough Gaming B550 Pro or take a look at the X570 series of motherboards, the X570 um, Pro or the Pro 2, both though feature uh, the internal USB-C header. Okay, uh, here you can see the rear IO, quite a solid rear IO connection where you got four there on the top, then two more USB. You can see the type C and then your traditional type A, two more high speed USB three, then you've got your 2.5 gigabit LAN that's on the board. I actually need to adjust my sleep settings there. Um, HDMI display port, your Wi-Fi 6 along with Bluetooth, and then your multi-channel lineable audio. And in case anybody is wondering, this board does fully come out of the box ready for uh, Ryzen 5000 series CPU. So you don't have to worry about kind of updating the motherboard or doing anything like that. You can just buy the CPU, install it, and you can get up and running, okay? No issues in that regard. 
Hey, uh, Clarence, um, actually, we've recently posted about quite a number. I'd actually would double check um, Amazon, um, especially. We've actually, over the last couple of weeks, had a number of different promotions on Z590 and a couple of Z490. Z490 is a little bit older, but definitely Z590 series. There have been a couple of promotion series where we had, I saw some fairly noticeable discounts um, between 20 to even, I think, more than $30 on some motherboards um, that were actually um, on promotion. So if you were looking for a socket 1200 series motherboard, we actually have quite a number of models that are still available and actually are on promotion. So um, I would definitely check that out. My recommendation, it depends on, of course, if you're looking for overclocking enabled board or non-overclocking enabled board, but take a look at maybe um, the ROG Strix Z590-A, I think it's a really, really solid choice, um, or the ROG Strix Z590-E gaming, um, or of course the Z590 um, Tough Gaming Plus. Um, those are all really solid options that you could be taking a look at there. Okay, so that uh, wraps up the introduction there for the Tough Gaming B550 Plus Gaming Wi-Fi 2. Um, you should probably be seeing it in terms of availability in the coming month or so, and we'll definitely make sure to let you guys know once it's actually hit in terms of overall channel availability. All right, guys. So that covers us uh, there. Give me one second here. Okay, so next up here, I'm just going to... Reset this. Give me one second here. All right, great. So uh, next item that we want to go ahead and jump into is actually going to be a monitor. So the next two monitors that we're going to be talking about are from our Tough Gaming lineup. So these are positioned uh, generally underneath our ROG Strix series and our ROG series, which are highest end monitors. That doesn't mean that they are low spec monitors. Um, they are very feature rich. Just generally means that you won't find certain things like maybe dedicated G-Sync modules built into these. And generally they're going to feature, uh, of course, a lower price point than the higher end panels that we're going to have on the ROG Strix or the ROG uh, Swift series of monitors where you're generally going to get even higher brightness, um, larger dimensions, and just overall kind of the most cutting edge type of specifications. Um, these two monitors that we're going to be talking about, though, are very interesting because they're curved monitors. So uh, for those of you that may be looking to be able to kind of increase the immersion, maybe upgrade in this regard, uh, might be two solid options for you. So let's go ahead and take a first look here at the VG uh, 30 VQ. L1A. So this is going to be a pretty, what I refer to as an aggressively curved monitor. So if you're not familiar, when you talk about curved monitors, you do have a number of different, uh, what are called curvatures. Um, and essentially just what this means is the amount that the monitor will curve in, will essentially will will come into your viewing plane. Um, and so there's essentially monitors that have a more subtle curve. So they're almost going to maintain kind of a flat um, perspective, very similar to a traditional monitor, and then ones that just have a little bit of a curve, just kind of start to come in a little bit, and then ones that do definitely start to come in quite a bit more aggressively. Um, both of these monitors are a 1500R curvature, which means that they do come in quite a bit, so they are really going to kind of wrap in to be able to give you a higher degree of immersion. And that's really kind of one of the benefits that you would have when you go to a curved monitor as opposed to a flat monitor. Um, flat monitors, it can be sometimes difficult for some people in terms of the periphery and the corners of a monitor when you're taking a look at the image to not necessarily uh, be able to strain or essentially you might have some distortion in the corners of your image. When you go with a curved monitor, normally even at the same, same size, it will actually seem larger because you actually will be able to see kind of this greater field of view um, and you'll generally get a little bit less distortion. The one catch though is, is that um, these aggressive curvatures on these monitors, uh, give me one second guys here, let me just set this here. Um, the aggressive curvatures on a monitor will also, though, sometimes present a little bit more glare. So you do want to keep in mind that from that perspective, um, you might want to be as sensible in terms of kind of where you position the monitor in terms of kind of overhead lighting. OK, so let's go ahead and take a look here at uh, these two monitors. All right, here you can see. So this is going to be a, a large format display. You can see you've got rich connectivity. It's got an integrated USB 3.0 hub. Uh, you can see you've got multiple display connections. And then you have your, of course, your uh, headphone jack. Got a nice, clean, open base, which just makes it nice for giving you still a good amount of space to where you can position you know, your keyboard, your mouse, and essentially any type of the items directly underneath that. 
you are still going to have a range of ergonomic adjustments. Um, generally, though, with the 1500 curvature, you are going to see that they are going to be a little bit of a bulkier body as opposed to the thinner profile that you're going to have with a flatter base display. That's also something you may want to account for a little bit if you do want to use a monitor arm as opposed to utilizing the traditional monitor stand. OK, um, let's go ahead and actually pull up the product page for this guy. And I will show you guys a little bit more here. So give me one second to load it up for you. And also double check and make sure and see if you, uh, if any of you guys have any questions here. All right, so here we go. So you can see again, this is the VG30 VQ L1A. It is a curved base display, 30 inches, uh, 21 by nine. So that just essentially means it's a ultra wide um, aspect ratio. 2560 by 1080, so that is going to be a higher resolution than traditionally your standard kind of HD uh, monitor, so it's going to give you more pixels, so it'll be sharper. Um, 200 hertz, which is nice, so you're definitely going to get a very fast kind of uh, responsive display. One millisecond MPRT, that is not going to be as fast as traditional one millisecond rate of gray, but overall, uh, it is still going to be a fast and responsive display, okay? Um, this extreme low motion blur, essentially, is just the technology to help to improve motion clarity. It's an option that you can toggle on or off in our software settings, excuse me, in our on-screen display settings. It's entirely up to you. And then 127% uh, sRGB is essentially just the coverage. Um, and that's uh, nice because it just helps to mean this is going to be a punchy and vibrant kind of type of display. Okay. So um, overall, Let's go ahead and you can see here, like I said, it's 1500R in terms of the curvature, up to 200 hertz in terms of the refresh rate. It does support adaptive sync, which is great. Um, that means that you can go ahead and have full certification for AMD-based graphics cards. Does not feature decent compatibility, so do keep that in mind. Um, you do have high dynamic range support, but it's because it's not a high brightness based monitor. Um, it's essentially just might be something that you might want to try on and see if it maybe gives you a little bit of contrast or kind of punch in terms of colors. But for most users, I would expect they would use this monitor in an SDR or essentially a standard um, uh, color range mode. Okay. The, uh, the extreme low motion blur technology that we talked about. Now, this is a cool technology right here is variable overdrive. This essentially just means that the monitor will adapt its overdrive setting based on the actual, um, excuse me, the, the, the frame rate, essentially. And the value that you have there is that uh, occasionally, if you keep your kind of overdrive setting locked, um, it might not necessarily always present to be as kind of smooth or as clear as it could be. So having generally a variable overdrive usually is going to be more favorable at giving you an overall better experience when it comes to motion clarity. Um, so this is a nice feature to be able to see that we have incorporated here on this monitor. Um, this is also a really cool option right here, the just display widget software. Um, some people kind of I wonder, well, like, why would I use software with a monitor? The cool thing is here is that this software lets you control all the on-screen display options on the monitor. So that means you don't have to physically like go touch the buttons on the monitor. Um, I'm a really big fan of this because it just means that you can go ahead and more easily change different options on your monitor without having to physically touch the monitor and go through different types of menus. Um, there's also a cool option that you can pair the monitor to be linked to different applications. So you could have like a profile set for like a game. So if you jumped into something like Ori in the Blind Forest or Forza or Apex, you could have it change into different modes um, all dynamically. Just configure it to what you want specific to that application, then link it to that application. And then once you open it up, the monitor will essentially change how it looks and how it responds based on the applications you're opening. Uh, you can see those connectivity. You got your HDMI, your HDMI, and your display port. And uh, you do have the ability, you can see here, you can tilt the display and swivel the display and also have height adjustments. So three different levels of ergonomic adjustment available to you. So overall, it's gonna be a pretty cool monitor. It's gonna be coming out very shortly. And definitely for those of you that are looking for something that's gonna be curved, then you know this might be a, an option for you guys. All right, guys, uh, let me go ahead and just see a question right here. Oh, awesome, right there, man. Uh, well. Thanks for joining us into the fray, man. Thank you so much. Uh, and GPS Stuntman, hey, man, happy to have you. Thanks for joining us back here on the stream, man. So uh, that is going to be the first monitor right here. Again, we've got the, uh, excuse me, uh, the, the VG30 uh, uh, VQL1A. So great option if you're looking, again, for a ultra-wide curved base monitor, 1500R. So do keep that in mind. So our next monitor here is going to be a little bit uh, smaller than that, but we're also going to be keeping that trend uh, with a more, uh, excuse me, with a curved base display. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at this guy right here. Load this up for you as well. All right, there we go. So this monitor here, we're gonna drop down from 30 inches and we're gonna essentially be at approximately almost 24 inches. So quite a bit more uh, compact, uh, which could be favorable depending on your kind of use case, right? Um, only a 1080 based display in terms of its resolution, but 1080p is a fantastic resolution, resolution for a lot of you that are might be out there when you're gaming because it's gonna be, of course, a very easy resolution for a wide range of graphics cards to drive. And especially if you got a pretty good quality graphics card, that just means that you can drive very high frame rates um, at 1080p and while still maintaining very high image quality, right? You can support up to 165 hertz on this display. It does support our extreme low motion blur technology as well and adaptive sync. And this is also going to be a 1500R uh, curvature. So yeah, essentially you can either go with this one right here at 24 inches or you can go with the 30 inches. Both are gonna be uh, 1500R. This one's gonna be 1080p. And of course the VG30 is going to be 2560, okay? Um, so. Overall, the rest of kind of the key specifications are gonna be pretty similar in terms of kind of what we talked about uh, already for the prior display. Uh, here, we didn't run through some of these. These are essentially our um, in-game enhancement options. So you things like shadow boost. You also have game plus mode, uh, which will allow you to have on-screen assets like a crosshair, timer, FPS counter, game visual, which is pretty actually cool. Some people don't kind of think about using these options, but I can tell you they do sometimes notice that they make a difference and um, they can give you a little bit more punch or contrast or improve kind of the responsiveness under different types of games. So sometimes it actually might be worthwhile to actually try it out. And again, the cool part um, with the display widget technology a software that I told you is that you can dynamically change those up. Uh, connectivity, you can see you've got HDMI, uh, 1.4 as opposed to the higher end VG has the 2.0, display port and the earphone jack. Ergonomics, you can see the 30 has more range of ergonomics where it's gonna have the height, swivel, and tilt, and here you only have tilt, okay? Uh, but this monitor does also, it's not listed here on the product page, but you'll see, excuse me, on the primary product page, but you'll see here in the specs, it still does support that display widget software. So both of these monitors do have the ability to allow you to go ahead and control um, the monitor from within the operating system once you install that software. Hey, Marco, um, I'm not sure what your question is uh, when it comes to what you're wondering about the PG32UQ. So we have actually begun to push that monitor out. It is actually now started to become available. I will actually let you guys know that if you do have that monitor, some might be interested in is that we actually have also released a new updated HDR, HDR profile for that monitor. Um, it does require a firmware update. So um, let me actually show you that. Some people actually aren't aware of this. So this is actually maybe a good question uh, to pose here. But let me actually go ahead and bring up the product page and I will show you what I mean. So um, on occasion, especially now with newer monitors, there can be situations where you may potentially um, have essentially firmware, just like kind of you get with your motherboard, that can help to improve the experience of the monitor. Um, sometimes you find through internal testing, um, you know, areas that we can improve upon, or, and sometimes it's based on maybe community or user feedback. So an example right here is if we take a look at this guy, the PG3TUQ, and we head over to the support page, what we're gonna wanna do is head over to the driver tab, and once we head over there, um, tick your operating system. It doesn't really matter, okay? Uh, but you'll actually see that you might have different per, uh, different items that are available. So you can see right here, you have a, a driver, the display widget software, the Armory Crate software, right? There can be different packages of items that can be made available, okay? Um, and on occasion, you might also then see another tab that might show other. And when you click on other, then that would actually allow you to have access to, let's say something like a firmware file um, for potential flashing purposes. Now, depending in certain scenarios, you may actually have to um, contact our service and support center to find out what may be the parameters of how that monitor gets updated. So just something to keep in mind. All right, guys. All right, so uh, we've got one other monitor. Uh, let me go ahead and get this guy loaded up here.
very cool. Okay, and this is gonna be a much more entry-level monitor, um, not gaming focused, right? But maybe for some of you that are just gonna be looking for a nice, good quality monitor upgrade, a little bit larger, um, you know, with a clean design, maybe something to have as a secondary display, maybe with the laptop, a secondary system, or something along those lines. That's really where the VA series is a very popular range of monitors that we offer. So here you can see we've got the VA 27 uh, DCP. Um, so it's 27 inches, it's a full HD, so that means 1920 by 1080. IPS display, so that means good access in terms of viewing uh, the display. Very thin bezels. Um, now this is gonna be the cool thing. A lot of our newer monitors we're incorporating with the USB-C connection, so that makes it very seamless in terms of being able to offer you a streamlined connection option in terms of power and display. Um, so you can see right there, 75 Hertz also, excuse me, uh, just a little bit more than your traditional monitor. You still get adaptive sync, and of course our blue light filtering options, and you still have VESA mount support. And also I would say that something that might be overlooked in more of the entry level displays that are out there on the market is the warranty. Some manufacturers in their more entry-level displays only offer a one-year warranty. Across the board on all ASUS monitors in North America, we offer a three-year warranty. Um, so I do feel that that's an advantage that we offer. And we also, for many of them, uh, offer what's called our Advanced Rapid Replacement Program. And you can definitely find out more about that on the corresponding product page. Um, but you'll see nice, clean uh, design thin bezels, like I said, IPS based, it works really well if you're looking also for a multi-monitor configuration, maybe for some productivity. And again, with that USB-C connectivity also makes it very streamlined in terms of that. So let's go ahead and just uh, double check here the total number of display connections that you're gonna have here. And you'll see right there that you have a USB-C port. There's one that's on the rear. Then you've got your HDMI you've got your earphone jack, and then you can see that the USB-C uh, does offer you a 65 watt power delivery. So that is nice there, because that does cover a good amount of, I'd say more kind of in the ultrabook category or kind of thin and light laptops uh, for pass through power. So in terms of the PG3 TQ, we actually did cover that. It has already gone ahead and been launched. Um, so in terms of availability from our website, our focus is not offering it on our website. Our focus is always on trying to ensure broader availability in terms of channel partners. The challenge that you have is that keep in mind that right now there are a lot of logistic concerns with a lot of different um, e-tailers. Uh, they take some quite a bit of time to be able to process uh, um, products and get them actually listed. So even once actually something comes in from, um, let's say reception, so from our production centers, uh, is received here in America and then processed by our teams, there still can actually be a, a very extensive amount of time once we actually send that out from distribution to those channel partners. And that time frame, um, it can really vary. Sometimes it could be a few days, sometimes it can actually be a few weeks. Um, sometimes it can be more than a month and a half and it really varies respectively dependent on the systems and the logistics of those partners. So this could vary from, um, you know, let's say Amazon to Newegg to, b &H to Best Buy, um, they all will have their different levels. So that is just something you wanna keep in mind. My recommendation would be is that we have overhauled our site to um, try to enhance the where to buy linking system. And so what I would recommend is that if you take a look at the site, there's usually a now a where to buy button and that will give you direct linking two different types of products um, to at least the listings for those respective products. Um, so that may help you in terms of helping to kind of see which vendors have gone ahead and actually then listed the product. And then from there, you can then sign up for notifications from that corresponding uh, e-tailer if they do have a notification system for once they actually have the product in stock, because there can also be the difference between them just kind of getting it listed in their system, as opposed to then having the product be available for you to purchase. All right, um, hopefully that answers your questions there. All right, so that is the uh, VA series monitor. So lastly, here is just a, a soft update. Of course, some of you might be wondering, we had some questions regarding, did we have essentially a graphics card that aligned with the um, RX 6600 launch? And we do, um, definitely I'm fully aware that of course, for many of you, there's of course the challenge and the concern about you know GPU availability. And uh, rest assured, we're continuing to work with partners as best as we can to be able to provide um, them cards so they can list them. And the best I can recommend is just continue to monitor, of course, any of the e-tailer channels that you're looking at for graphics card availability. Um, I essentially just want to help to confirm. Um, we had a couple of users ask, are you going to come out with the model? Um, and I just want to confirm which model we actually will have available. So we will only have a initially right now an RX 66 uh, under the dual series. Um, so the dual series is 
Um, I'd say positioned underneath our ROG Strict series and our Tough Gaming series. So it's got a little bit more of kind of streamlined, minimal design. It's black with usually some silver accents. Still very solid in terms of its overall fan and, uh, fan and heatsink design. So it's going to be cool and quiet. Um, Good, call, good quality design because it's utilizing our auto extreme production process where essentially we have a robotic system that places all the components on our cards. That occurs on our most entry cards to the highest end cards. And we're the only manufacturer in the industry that does auto extreme production for all of the graphics cards in our lineup. And uh, no other manufacturer right now offers that level of essentially production um, implementation practices. So that's something that we're very proud about. Okay, um, and you can see pretty straightforward, no RGB, pretty much the card is just focused at being able to give you cool and quiet operation. Features our new Axial Tech fans that we've now had on uh, first released on our higher end cards and the zero DB operating technology. Some people kind of wonder essentially just what that really means. And again, just to confirm, what does that mean? It just means that when the card um, has essentially a minimal load, so, uh, it's not consuming a large amount of power. And generally that's gonna be, it depends on different cards. Different cards have different power ratings. But as an example, um, 55 watts, uh, which would generally mean like you probably idling in the desktop or something like that, or maybe a very basic type of game load, then the fans won't spin at all. And essentially the card will be essentially almost operating in, so, in pure zero dB. Now it's important to keep in mind that in sub configurations, even if you're not running a game, you may not hit zero dB mode. Um, some users get confused by this. This can happen sometimes in multi-monitor configurations, especially multi-monitor configurations that are running at high refresh rates. Many users don't realize that when you're running like a 160, 165 hertz, a 240 hertz monitor, 4K multiple monitors, you're actually placing a heavier load on the graphics card than if you were just running like a single 1080p display. And when you're running essentially more of that heavy load, that will actually cause the card to pull more power. And so essentially the trigger for it stopping or starting the fans um, essentially will, uh, will uh, cause it to no longer essentially be able to kick into that zero dB operating mode because it's essentially too much power is being requested. There's also sometimes like applications that can use the GPU that you might not be realizing. Um, so sometimes you might find that you might have to close out certain programs that are running in the background that are essentially using the graphics card, but they're not using it in a super heavy way, but they're using it in a way that enough, um, it's also affecting the load or the power consumption of the card. So a couple of things to keep in mind when we talk about zero dB operating mode. Hey, Chad, uh, what we do, uh, you can actually join a PCDIY Facebook group and you'll actually see that there's all tons of users that we do have that have cards. Uh, the reality is that there's a lot of different factors right now within the marketplace as far as, you know, challenges to be able to have, you know, um, the quantity of, I think, cards that users are making card, but it's not a question that we're not producing cards because we're actively producing the cards. You have to take a look at a wide range of different aspects in terms of market conditions and um, the practices that are in place from e tailors in terms of how they allow cards to be purchased and many other kind of factors in that regard. Um, you know, so it is definitely a challenging aspect, but you know, from our end, we're continuing to uh, essentially put out as many cards as possibly as we can um, and, you know, work from that perspective. So uh, we're going to continue to do that and, um, you know, and try to ensure that, you know, we're working with as many channel partners as we can to be able to ensure that there's availability through their channels. But, um, you know, my recommendation is also, you know, make sure that you're also coordinating and reaching out to those um, e-tailers, you know, if you want to see revisions or changes in terms of their ordering practices um, to be able to improve upon, you know, the, the the ways that you can purchase cards from them, right? Because um, the, those are going to be also aspects that you want to keep in mind in that regard. Um, looks like that probably covers that question. So let me go ahead and now keep moving that along there. All right. Very cool. So um, that actually covers pretty much all of the updates that I wanted to give in terms of new products um, and as well as our kind of Windows 11 updates. So now uh, I want to get ready to actually jump into talking a little bit about our um, PC DIY Builders a Spotlight. So this is always an exciting uh, thing for me because, of course, it gives us the opportunity to be able to showcase your guys' amazing builds that we find within the community. Um, before I do jump into this, though, let me go ahead and just set this uh, so that I don't forget about it anymore. So give me one second, guys. Okay. Um, and 
be able to kind of show you guys some really cool things. So uh, before I jump into the BC PC Dower Builder Spotlight, some of you may, may or not be aware that RG is getting ready to celebrate its 15th anniversary, right? Um, I've been lucky enough to be with the company for almost that entire length of time that RG has been around. So I've literally seen RG grow from being one single product, um, you know, the very first ROG Crosshair series motherboard, to, you know, now where, you know, really ROG is the definitive gaming brand in the PC hardware ecosystem, right? And we produce, you know, uh, the absolute best in terms of laptops motherboards, graphics cards, monitors, routers, um, you know, amazing peripherals and so many other products within the ROG family. Um, and one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is innovative design. And what I thought might be interesting maybe over the next few weeks is to be able to kind of pick a couple of interesting products that some of you may be aware of, some of you may not be aware of, and see what did you guys think about when we kind of decided to maybe, you know, change maybe the direction of how some things were looked at from a kind of design perspective. And the one that I wanted to bring up here is a pretty cool one. Um, and this one is called the ROG Avalon. So um, with the Avalon, we had kind of a specific, I would say, focus um, in terms of what we were looking to achieve. And part of the perspective here in terms of the design was to be able to offer a system that would still be what would refer to as kind of like a traditional PC DIY type system that had upgradability, supported kind of enthusiast level componentry, but also could really simplify the overall experience of how you went about kind of installing different types of aspects, uh, in installing kind of the system and just kind of general kind of usability. And also I think break up the kind of the traditional design perspective. Now keep in mind this design, um, this concept design I'm gonna show you is from almost five years ago. And I think it actually preempts a lot of the kind of the trend that we've seen move over in terms of some of the design aesthetics. Um, and in some ways also um, still is, is something that hasn't necessarily been reached even now. So it's a very interesting concept. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. So this is the ROG Avalon. So um, you can see it's actually a much more compact system. It's gonna be more like a box design than it is gonna be like a vertical tower that we're kind of more traditionally now looking at when we talk about a traditional ATX based gaming PC, especially over the last few years with tempered glass panels, we've seen a, a lot of the trend being about how much we can see inside of the system, especially with RGB lighting. And here we did definitely have RGB lighting accessibility and there was internal even kind of design concepts to say we could have different types of materials and different types of panels on the side. So you could actually have transparent side housings for the two sides of the system. That smoked kind of top cover could also be entirely different. Um, we could even have that customized to actually be have it be a full size display. So you'd actually have a display that could maybe be a full real-time readout that you would see that would be part of the chassis. Um, and because it's not necessarily the size of a whole system, you have a lot of different flexibility in terms of, I think, the visual and how you can immediately see that on your desk. Um, there in the front, you'll see that there's cool things like you got four immediate hot swap drives that you could have access to. Now those were SATA drives, but easily because they were linked in directly into the specialized motherboard design, those could be four M.2 slots, right? So you could literally just uh, and quickly install just by clicking a button, injecting out the drive, you could put in M.2, 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 or they could, like I said, still be traditional SATA. There was, even at this time, five years ago, we already kind of were seeing the trend you had full type C connectivity. So these were two USB type C ports that were on um, the chassis. Um, you can see right there, the drive actually being ejected outwards. Now we've taken that top cover off and now you're gonna see that while you might think that this might have maybe been just a standard mini ITX, this was actually a custom motherboard. Um, and so the design, we still wanted to have a little bit more flexibility. So instead of only having two dims, you can actually have up to four dims. In this generation, I don't know if you necessarily need four dims because you can now actually have, um, you know, very high density uh, memory within two DIMM configurations. Um, so you could actually achieve 64 gigabytes in just two DIMMs. And with DDR5, you're also gonna be able to have even higher density. So again, it's not critical, but even being able to have four from a visual perspective, or if you really wanted a large amount of memory, it would be possible within the system. It's also nice that you would immediately be able to pull the cover off and you could have direct access again to the CPU, to the DRAM right there in front of you, very easy access. Um, here we can see it removed without the cooler and you can see a direct access to the CPU socket, to the DRAM. Then there's actually an M.2 slot that's directly there on the motherboard as well. Um, here's one of the side panels 
beautiful finished aluminum, which actually had fins built into it. So it had direct kind of airflow that would be able to kind of go in and out. Um, but again, we had a lot of different types of internal concepts. It didn't necessarily maybe have to be a, a um, you know, metal material. It could actually be maybe a recycled plastic type of material. It could actually be a tempered glass, maybe with perforations. Uh, there, um, well, not tempered glass with perforations. That could be very challenging, but maybe an acrylic with perforations. Um, you know, there's a lot of different types of options for that side panel. Even you could have customized designs, right? Where you could actually have these changed out over time um, more traditionally than you would, excuse me, more easily than you would be able to do with the standard chassis. Here's the opposite side. And here you can see the rear. Now where the rear gets really interesting is that the rear utilizes some really interesting design mechanisms. So one, the IO that you're gonna see is fully modular. So it actually utilizes essentially specialized edge connectors and PCA Express integration to be able to actually have a removable IO bracket. So you could remove that. And if you wanted maybe one that had dual LAN or maybe you wanted one that had 10 gigabit LAN or had more USB-C, or maybe is gonna have like 100, and 100 watt USB PD output, right? Or you maybe the original design only had a two by two Wi-Fi six, and then you want to do like Wi-Fi six E or something like that. You could literally remove the actual IO and then install a new IO module. So I thought that was pretty awesome in terms of what you see. So you can actually see right here where you could pull this out and then pull it in. And again, this is a very friendly experience. Uh, one, you can't even do this right now in traditional systems. And even for first time builders, this could be something that would be easy for them to do. They could just literally order the bracket that they would want online, pull that part out and then put the new one in, right? Um, very cool, very easy. Directly below that, um, you'll see the power supply and we'll show you something cool about the power supply, but you can see that once we remove one of the panels off of it, we have direct access to be able to still have a traditional mounting for a high performance radiator, 240 millimeter radiator, which is kind of the standard in the industry as far as a high performance cooling solution. You could still fit custom water cooling setups in here or traditional AIO setups, so you weren't limited in that regard. Um, you could still see we could fit a large traditional high performance graphics card and here no ribbon cables uh, ribbon cables can add um, signal degradation issues emi problems there can be a lot of challenges with utilizing ribbon cables here we have a custom designed motherboard that essentially just has a direct right angle connection right there and the graphics card directly docks in so you don't have to kind of do this weird hold in the card and kind of balance it out there worrying about sag or anything like that just dock it directly there into the side the cables would be right there and you would plug them in and you would be good to go. And that's the other big difference is that here, this system relied heavily on a lot of what are called edge connectors feeding into everything. So really from an end user perspective, there would really almost only be, you know, maybe four or five cables that you would have to actually end up connecting at all to be able to get your system up and running. So it was a far kind of simpler, or cleaner experience. So all the way around, uh, a really cool and interesting design that I think um, I would love to kind of see it actually be kicked off again and revised and you know show um, you know different concepts. I really love the concept of like I said, having this maybe be a fully customizable. Imagine this being like an OLED display that right here would be on the front with full stat readout information that you could have con uh, that you would have reading out you know your temperatures or having kind of just cool images or gifs. You could have imagine having the sides be kind of custom colored, right? Um, you know, or painted, or you know, having it be different material, maybe wood, or like I said, um, um, you know, any different different types of different options, right? Some really cool stuff there. And if we also take a look here, um, let me go ahead and show you interesting just some of the other elements of kind of the internal design here where it gets pretty interesting. So give me one second, guys, and then we'll show you a couple of the other elements here. Yeah, this should be good right here. Yeah, correct, Connor. So really it was um, kind of, it wasn't just about, I think, offering the flexibility of being able to upgrade it more easily, but I think it was also making the build experience fundamentally easier. So I think what we have seen is that there are users that totally love kind of the traditional PC DIY approach and want to be able to fine tune every single thing. But there's some builders that do want kind of the ability to upgrade and change things and want the performance of a desktop 
but maybe with a more simplified and kind of clean design perspective. And so this wouldn't necessarily be a replacement for all the traditional type of motherboard offerings and the products offerings that we have, but it could maybe become a new type of product offering that would kind of be a hybrid PC DIY experience, right? So this could be, I wanna buy the ROG Avalon, this base platform system, but I know that I have the flexibility of being able to do this really simply and really easily, right? Where I don't have to worry about, is this compatible or is this gonna be this? I can just really focus on how many drives do I want to attach? Do I want to maybe add this new cool lighting attachment to the system? Do I want more IO, right? Um, those type of things to be able to just make kind of the experience, you know, easier for somebody, but that still doesn't want to compromise on, I think, a lot of aspects when it comes to performance and upgradability, right? So when we take a look here, again, you can see this is where the, um, where the IO block has been fully removed. And here you can see it set up with a custom water cooling system. So you could still see we could fully fit custom water cooling in there with no issues, right? Um, here is the custom motherboard. You can see it's a very different type of motherboard. You can see there on the bottom is where all the actual um, bays were aligned with for those front hot swap bays that you had in terms of storage. Right, And even the audio board, this featured an entirely discrete, specialized, high quality audio board that attached to the motherboard. Similar to kind of like what we've almost done on mini ITX motherboards, but even a higher degree. And there could even be uh, optional, even higher performing. So we could have like very high grade DAC amp daughter boards that could be kind of swapped in and out that plugged in directly into the motherboard for a very high level of performance. But then when you're using your system, you'd still have those standard connections. And even from specialized connections, those of you might have like really high end headphones that have like XLR, like balance connections, you could now have those connectors built onto the motherboard, right? Uh, through that actual IO bracket that could be replaced. So really, really, really cool, really different. Um, here you can see, uh, of course, just some other shots of the board. Here you can see just the different types of IO, right? So you can see this one, um, which was more VR setup, right? Where it had the HDMI, it had dual LAN, these USB. Here you can see a different type of con configuration, right? That we have here. And then you can see another type of configuration, right? So um, all of these were kind of optionally able to be kind of swapped in and out. And you could just go with the one that you thought made the most sense. Uh, yeah, so Sander, um, let me go back and I'll show you uh, the picture here for where the radiator mounted. Um, and here, the power supply, this was the other nice thing is the power supply was really much simpler to install because there were no all these crazy cables. Um, you essentially only had just two uh, two just linked cables to go into the graphics card. But the whole power supply used a type of design that you see more commonly in high-end server type installations, which are using uh, edge connectors. So literally that's how the power supply, the power supply would literally just slide in dock and direct direct power to the motherboard. This actually has lower resistance, better efficiency, and overall even better performance. It would require a custom PSU, but we could have these in module, um, you know, multiple versions, right? You know, an 850 watt, a thousand watt, a 1200 watt, 1600 watt. I mean, we'd have to consider dimensions as well, um, but just to give you an idea, right? You don't have all the complexity of uh, kind of all these cables. You could literally just pull this out, push it in, and that would be it, right? Um, far simpler. And here you can see some of the power topology layout where the actual power delivery is actually on the bottom of the motherboard, not on the top of the motherboard. So very different. But um, let me show the image here for somebody that was asking like where the fans went, right? So here you can see this is actually the side of the chassis. And you, this is actually where you would then mount those fans for the radiator, right? And if you had like an air tower cooler set up, the top could actually even be larger if you want to have like a traditional tower heat sink. And like I said, that could actually have perforations if you wanted more dynamic airflow as opposed to just the sides, which were perforated, right, in terms of the paneling. And here was the other side uh, for where the graphics card installed, right? So, Overall, um, a very cool design. Like I said, this is now more than five years old. We showed it off um, for the ROG 10th anniversary um, and ultimately um, never brought the product to fruition. But I thought it would be a really cool thing to show you guys and just show you just really, I think, how out of the box um, ROG. Uh, so the radiator goes on the same place. It doesn't know there, it, the radiator is different, right? So here's the graphics card on one side, right? And then you can see, uh, the rad. Yeah. Is, is, is there as you have your, your position mounting. Um, uh, actually, let me go ahead and show you then another shot, right? Where I showed you the water cooling, where you can also see kind of the spacing layout there too. Right. 
And then there's also some other space that could be utilized. So again, some of this wasn't 100% finalized as far as you know every single aspect because we never brought it entirely to fruition. Um, but you know, again, that the cool part is again essentially just showing you that it was a different approach that I don't think has been really seen. Even within many ITX systems, even current many ITX are still trying to kind of force using the same design convention. Uh, but without kind of the integration that I think a, a manufacturer like us that can bring, right? Because we're designing the motherboard. We could even take things even further. We could have like a fiber optic terminal that connects directly from the motherboard into the chassis so that every single LED and layout would be looped into the front panel. And you could actually see all your values, like your power, your debug, all in that OLED screen, right? There's a lot of really cool stuff that's possible that kind of bridges what you would see almost in a finished kind of product system, like in a laptop or like a pre-built um, um, but also being able to still make, kind of make it DIY, right? Well, guys, um, I don't want to take too much time from the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. I just, again, I wanted to, like I said, over the coming weeks, I wanted to take a couple of times to be able to show you guys something that is kind of out and about there in terms of the history of kind of ROG and the innovation that we've brought. Um, you know, ROG literally has been, the, I think, the most innovative hardware vendor in the industry, unquestionably, when we talk about, um, you know, I think, uh, core design, especially within the motherboard space and definitely within other spaces like graphics cards, um, peripherals, routers, uh, laptops, and many other kind of product spaces. Um, even within coolers, we were the first to introduce, um, you know, actually an OLED display on a cooler before actually anybody else. But even little things that you might not even realize, like the clear CMOS button was implemented first on an ROG motherboard. It was designed by one of our R&D team who was like, there should be a simpler way to be able to clear your CMOS than having to use a jumper and do it on a jumper. And so we were like, why not make a button so that you can click a button, right? Um, USB BIOS flashback, isolated audio design, right? These are all things that were first and foremost done on ROG. And now the industry has, of course, adopted many of these technologies that we innovated, but um, it just goes to show that we have really been the ones at the forefront of, I think, helping to evolve and refine the PC DIY experience. All right, um, so let me go ahead and um, jump up here and go to the next thing. Yeah, so USB BIOS flashback, um, that's a good point. Actually, I think you're already finding that it's a, a standard feature. Um, um, pretty much all the B550 refreshes, the B450 refreshes, Z590 down to, I think, like the Z590, I think, P have all had it. So we've progressively, I mean, again, that was a feature we invented, just like the integrated IO shield. It was something we invented. And it first came out on a very high-end motherboard, like the Rampage Edition 10. And now you can literally buy B and H series chipset motherboards that we produce with an integrated IO shield. Similarly, USB BIOS flashback first came out only on the highest end ROG motherboards, then rolled out to more motherboards and more motherboards. And now it's an industry-wide feature where even competitors have copied this feature and implemented it onto their motherboards, right? Um, so, you know, uh, I think, you know, that's, of course, the value of what ROG is, and I think that's the thing that we pride ourselves on is that we ask that when users support us, you're supporting innovation more so than anything else, is that you're supporting the progress and the refinement that we bring to the industry. All right, guys, um, let me go ahead and just jump in here now to the uh, next portion right here. So let's get into the USB BIOS flashback. Excuse me, <laughs> not USB BIOS flashback, but PC DIY Builders, a spotlight, guys. So uh, first build that I want to go ahead and touch on here is going to be from um, Su Chao Modding Design. Um, and it's possibly in my top 10 favorite builds and kind of mods of maybe all time. The amount of work that went into this, I think, is just... Um, extreme because it's truly kind of almost a one-off in terms of the project, um, in terms of the amount of effort that kind of he went that he went into, and in a lot of ways, I, it was um, you know a, a family effort in terms of getting this all up and running. So um, you know, really, really impressive stuff here. So let me go ahead and bring this guy up here. Now I don't have a full submission form for him. Um, I'm, I want to be able to go ahead and get this and hopefully revisit it a little bit later once I can get the full set of information in there. But uh, let's go ahead and first take a look at this first image to just kind of give you scale. So here we can see a great family uh, surrounding this build and this mod. And the thing that's going to be so impressive here that you see is that pretty much this is all custom. So it's pretty much all been 3D fabricated, then custom painted, right? And um, you have a mix of real hardware. So there's actually an ROG Mini ITX motherboard in there. There's an ROG Strix graphics card that's in there. It's water cooled, but it's all built into 
um, this modded essentially gaming room, uh, which is kind of an effect of the chassis. But the attention to detail, the subtle elements that have all been built into this and how cohesive it looks is absolutely outstanding. Super impressive when we take a look at the work here. So if we take a closer look um, here, we can see, of course, a a great shot of the outside and the attention to detail where you can see all the actual uh, 3D printed slabs which make up essentially kind of the brick wall, quote unquote, which then have been actually painted and then hand detailed, right, with all these nice graphics, right, um, looks stunning. And then, of course, you go a little bit deeper in and now you can see this full awesome mini ITX system that's essentially a gaming room. The gaming room in itself is powered by this real mini ITX board and graphics card. But yet you even see these subtle little monitors uh, that are built in where the graphics card is used as the table for uh, the gaming room. Right. And for where the system is, quote unquote. Right. Um, it's just it's just it brought a smile to my face. It was an absolutely stunning uh, work here. And really, I feel one of the absolute best builds and mods that I have seen. Uh, I think from its cohesion, from the quality of the execution to the details of what's implemented here, all these things being fabricated. And there's a huge amount of 3D printing work that's being done here, where you can see everything from these small tables um, to all these little miniature items that were all printed, right, and then painted, um, right? Um, the quality of them are just outstanding. So you can then see right here, there you can see is the ROG Strix board. You can actually see the uh, dual Decker quote unquote M.2 heatsink stack there in the audio board. There we've got the water block, uh, thermal take, uh, pretty much all the water cooling is all thermal take here. Um, you can see the actual RGB memory right there. You can then see actually the ROG Strix graphics card that's actually the table. Here's a close up of the board. So there you can more clearly see you got motherboard, water cooled, and then you can see your memory. Uh, there's a little close-up angled shot of the card. Uh, it's just fantastic. And then all these little subtle things like the street post lamp here, right? Um, this little gaming arcade in the corner. The tubes that you have um, around the entire perimeter are all the tubes that actually run into then uh, for the water cooling setup. Really, really impressive work. Look at this like little close-up shot. It's a little printed, you know, potato chip bag, right? With, you know, some soda, right? All set up here, right? It's just these little things all add up to the kind of the total detail and the time and work and effort put into this. Um, really just stunning work. Um, and it's just, like I said, uh, for me, definitely I feel one of the best builds that I've seen. Um, when I talk about a pure modding kind of perspective, um, it definitely really meets that mold and it's just an impressive level of detail that was committed there in terms of kind of getting this all up and running. Um, and lastly here, I just want to kind of run you through some of the just general work that I see here in terms of what was done in terms of kind of getting this to what you see there in the final form to, um, you know, the, the end project. So if again, we go with something like here where keep in mind, that's where you're going to get to, right? And now we're going to show it off like where you went to. You know, it's a whole nother thing, right? So you can just see all the work that went in here. All the modeling work. Here's all the 3D printers to go ahead and print everything out. Then being able to get these all actually laid out and positioned. Then, of course, getting them all actually cut, lined up, laid out correctly. Then you got to count for, of course, um, all the paint work, the lineup, getting all the fit and finish, right? As far as cleaning them, you can see the priming that was all done on all of these items. Uh, it's just amazing, right? And then you end up with something like this, right? Kudos, man. Uh, amazing, amazing build um, and just a great showcase. So um, really, I think is uh, at the core spirit of PCDIY. So amazing stuff right there. So next, uh, let's go ahead and go to our next build here. Uh, let me go ahead and jump into it and see what we've got. So I think uh, first one is going to be, uh, let me see. Actually, let me open up our forms here. And I think the first submission is going to be from uh, Mike Clark. Give me one second here to go ahead and get to the user.
actually, hold on. Uh, we'll get back to Mike in a moment. I got I went out of order there, so we're gonna go to Josh's build first. So I follows the same order as I have here with the submission forms. Okay, very cool. So let's go ahead and load these guys up here. Hey, SA. Oh man, fantastic to have you here, SA. Um, yeah, guys, uh, very lucky. One of the actual best, uh, one of the best builders and modders in the game, man. Thanks so much for joining the stream right here. So um, we don't have any builds from you. If you've got something new, um, I've featured quite a number of your guys' uh, stuff here on the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. Love to have you um, submit uh, another build or a showcase, man, because your guys' work is always fantastic, man. Always gets a thumbs up, man. So um, let's take a look here from Josh's build, what we got. So this is going to be not his first build. Uh, of course, it wasn't sponsored. Name of the system was ROG Ice. And uh, the overall three words that described the system was ROG Ice build. It's based on a Prime X570 board with a 3080 ROG Strix card and a Ryzen 5800X. We can definitely see we got those icy blue vibes. You can see we've got some customization there. It looks like some custom fan grills. He's also got um, a custom kind of, a, I think, shroud attachment there for the bottom of the chassis. Definitely giving me those kind of icy blue vibes there. It's cool. It's got a really kind of stylized aesthetic to it. Uh, here we can see it definitely with the RGB lighting off. Uh, the thing, you know, it's a little bit of a bummer. I mean, it's hard to tell. I, I love the dual tone contrast that we have right here within the custom cables, um, but I love being able to see that white and that blue here when the RGB is off on the system. And a lot of this has a beautiful aesthetic to it, even when it's off. So it'd be really interesting to see what it would almost look like when there's no that lighting or maybe just a single white light. Um, as opposed to kind of that blue light that's present in there, but um, really, really cool. And so we can see right here, yeah, we've got the Prime X570 board, some clean, nice cable management. Of course, we've got the card ho horizontally mounted, which is a preference for me in terms of that card aesthetic. I wish we had a little bit tighter photos that weren't vertically centered right here, but overall, um, it's definitely a cool build, man. And I like the touches here with the blue and the white contrast, right? Um, the only thing I'm always torn about in kind of this situation, but I think it definitely looks good for your build, is whether or not I would have flipped the radiator um, and then had the cable soup underneath the RAM and then kind of come out there on the right-hand side as opposed to the left. But you still routed it very tightly so that you still get that nice kind of little accent line on the RGB strip that the Prime board has. So I still think it works for you there, man. So no problems in that regard. Um, definitely most proud of the color scheme in terms of his build. Ice was the overall theme. Anything that he would change, he'd like to be able to get a, an all white Strix card to be able to just kind of complement the build, but definitely a challenge. Took him about six months, uh, I'm assuming, to kind of get everything together and then be able to build a system. It's pretty much a gaming system, so he uses it for playing Destiny 2, Halo, uh, Mass Effect, all uh, great games. And his favorite feature is Asus Strix GPUs. Uh, they look amazing and they perform great. So um, really cool build, man. Kudos. O overall, I think it's a great looking build. I love the aesthetic that you have here. And actually, you did do it here. We're here, we got the blue. And then here we've got this white. And I would agree. I think I'm a big fan of uh, kind of this little bit of a kind of lighter color so that we can see a little bit more of the kind of the, the tones and the gradient throughout the system. So overall, man, thumbs up, Josh. Nice build. All right, so let's take a look. Let's see who we got next here. Next is going to be, let me see. Who we got Giuseppe, I believe. Hopefully I'm saying your name correctly, Giuseppe. If not, my apologies. Uh, let me go ahead and get your images loaded in here. All right, getting this loaded up here. So let's see what we got. Ooh, looks like we got a hardline water-cooled system, but definitely I think with a little bit of a different approach in this. So this is actually Giuseppe's first build. Um, uh, kudos to you, Matt, for taking on a, a, a more complex build, uh, especially for your first time build. Uh, I will say I've seen that a little bit more uh, recently over the last kind of year and a half from builders is taking on more complex builds, even though it's their first builds. All right, so we can see we've got an RG Helios here. He removed the straps. He also went with RGB fans in the front of the Helios, which is always an interesting choice. There's about like half the Helios users that like to leave the Helios where you can see the actual 
RGB lighting, which is part of the tempered glass, and then uh, some other users that want to add more kind of pronounced lighting effects through also adding RGB fans. And I think both can work. I'm not kind of opposed to either one. Oh, he. I always ask if somebody's interested in included the cable management shot, and he did. Thumbs up, man. That's um, pretty nice cable management. Um, you know, as far as you got, anytime you got an RGB system, you're gonna have a lot of cables in there. And you know what? That's clean. It's well routed. Um, the only thing for me is that personally, I prefer to not have everything kind of packed together in one single strand because I like to sometimes separate my cables depending on what their use is. So sometimes if I can, I try to isolate a little bit more so that if I need to selectively kind of make an adjustment or change something out, I don't necessarily kind of have to unleash all of the cables, right? I, I might have a little bit better opportunity to be able to kind of manage just the set that I want to kind of get at, right? But overall, still um, clean, right? Which is, I think, the key part. It's got a really cool purple vibe. It's kind of set up. I like it. It looks good, man. And then we got some serious hardware set up here. So this is a really interesting look that you have here with a very kind of top heavy uh, kind of distro plate, reservoir, all your actual uh, fittings. And then of course the tubing and then the horizontal, excuse me, the vertically mounted graphics card. I think the vertically actually graphics card works probably in this type of scenario. I personally prefer horizontally mounted, but I think in the way that you've got everything kind of weighted, it probably makes more sense to probably go with the way that you situated it here. Uh, here we can see a little bit more closely kind of what we're taking a look at when we're not looking at it with the graphics card installed. So here you can see the, the board, um, and then he's got the monoblock on there from EK, right? And this actually looks to be a formula board, and he's using actually the bridge, which is cool because the bridge is like a monoblock which works in conjunction with the integrated VRM cooling. So you still get the cooling from the VRM, but you're also cooling the CPU. And then you can see we've got the memory there, and then you've got this big old of course, uh, re uh, you've got the pump and the reservoir over here, kind of, it's like a distro plate, um, really kind of integrated. It's a very interesting design where you're kind of bridging over the CPU into the distro plate, and then you've got your pump down there, and then you got your fans, and then you can see, you know, the radiator setup. It's a very interesting design. And I give credit to that because it's not like the same type of design that you kind of see over and over again, especially with a lot of the more traditional chassis like O11s and kind of a distro plate and it's just a whole bunch of horizontal lines. So I give you credit there, man, where you definitely tried something different. And I do think you pulled it off. Yeah, and the color scheme is overall cool. Yeah, I like it, man. Overall, a very cool build. Um, and I give you a lot of credit, man. I think overall it worked out pretty well in terms of um, you know what you were looking to achieve in terms of the look and the feel especially considering it's your first build, man, kudos. So name of the system, it's the Beast, three words that describe it. Epic, uh, excuse me, ultimate, epic, and beautiful. Um, Crosshair formula, as I noted, he's got a 37 uh, Strix card in there. It's in a Helios, 1200 watt Thor card in there, also using our Asus riser cable. Um, he's using cable mod purple themed cables, a 1500X. He's got a lot of M.2 storage, two terabyte, one terabyte. Uh, Corsair dominators, um, Corsair QL fans that is in there and 120s and 140s. And then pretty much it looks like all of the majority of the um, water cooling hardware is EK, except that he's got uh, a Corsair radiator um, and then uh, Corsair uh, t uh, satin tubes. So about $5,400 in terms of the cost. Uh, he's most proud of the hardline tubing. And I would agree uh, because it's a non-traditional layout. I definitely, I would say that it's been pulled off well. Uh, purple theme. Uh, he wanted to go with a 3080 Ti Strix card. He would still love to be able to change that. And overall, it took him about a year's worth of time to be able to actually get all the hardware, which I'm assuming definitely one of them was probably just getting the graphics card. Um, Uses it for um, gaming and university-related work, uh, such as uh, Fusion 360. He plays a lot of Mass Effect, Destiny 2, FIFA, and Forza. And his favorite feature is Armory Crate. Man, uh, overall, kudos. It's a, it's a cool build, man, and definitely get a thumbs up from me, man, and thanks for being part of Team ROG, man. Giuseppe, nice one. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our next build here. Next build is going to be, let me see here. Who do we got? Uh, John, yep, John Lee. All right. Oh, yes. John Lee's got a cool build here. This is going to be a small form factor build, which is always, always interesting. I'm always, it's always, always kind of cool to be able to see what somebody does when you go about kind of with a, a smaller size system and you go kind of mini ITX.
All right. Oh, I'm liking this already. This is very interesting. Got a cool kind of color scheme right here with the soft kind of gradient right there. Uh, kind of blue going into white. Very nice. Oh, uh, yeah, you can see for scale, right? Got to throw it in for scale. You got your, your can right there. Looks like your classic 12-ounce can. And then you can see everything that you fit into the system. There he's gone ahead and pulled off the front where you can see you've got the two large, uh, looks like Landy fans that we have in there from a cooling setup configuration. Yeah, I'm, and I like these little just side accents right here from the uni fans that we can see. And then, of course, there at the top, you can also, of course, see that you've got the uh, the pump and the res right there, right? And then you've got your block in there uh, and some interesting runs right there just to add a little bit of kind of variation. Uh, it looks like probably like Mystic Fog that's in there um, from that. Oh, I love the kind of different vibe. What does everybody think? Do they like the, do they like the blues or do they like the kind of the pink and the purple? Um. I could kind of go either which one. They both kind of have a little different vibe. Maybe one's like half the week and the other one's, you know, maybe one's part of the work week and then one's part of the weekend, right? <laughs> uh, and then we have the other side right there. Yeah, we can see right here. Yeah, this is, of course, a split chassis design. You can see with the mini ITX board, we can see all the tubing running in. We've got the reservoir right, excuse me, the radiator there in the front. And then your tubing running out to the other side. You've got your DRAM and you've got your, of course, your compact PSU there. This is really well done, especially for a small form factor system. Very cleanly, uh, well executed. And this is where it's definitely challenging, but this is the benefit of course water cooling as opposed to doing this through a traditional kind of AAO route where you kind of have to be bending tables. Taking the time to get everything measured out and done correctly, one, you're gonna get a much better thermal performance than you would using an AIO. Um, ideally a quieter system, right? But you can also really dial things in and you can also make these a little bit more of a visual point where kind of trying to do that with an AIO type of setup and the cabling that it would introduce would definitely be more challenging. And I do like the approach that he went with just nothing but pure black cables in here because I feel if they would have been colored, they would almost kind of distract from the rest of the system. So um, nicely done there as far as overall, I think the choices that you made, they were intelligent. Um, so let's see, not his first build, I would, I would see that. Um, name have a build, it's called Toasty. Um, and three words to describe it, clean, colorful, and custom. Uh, let me go ahead and bring up his list right here just to see what he's working with. So 5900X, so he's dealing with a serious CPU there. So he's definitely got some heat to put out. Um, it's on an RG Strix B550-I gaming board, 64 gigabytes worth of RAM, um, SN750 M.2 drive, one terabyte, along with another two terabyte drive from Samsung. Uh, he's got a uh, Asus Tough Gaming 3080, and that's all built in, of course, the Meshalicious, which is one of the newest, kind of most popular uh, split ITX chassis that's out on the market. 750 watt power supply, and then those uni fans in there from, uh, of course, Landy. Um, overall, man, very cool build, man. I'm, I'm digging it. I, I really like this. Uh, so. Uh, pretty much looks like, yeah, uh, everything is from all uh, from EK when we talk about the core co uh, components. Um, the custom 3D plane, oh, that's interesting. So this, the custom 3D printed water block cover with RGB LED strip. Um, and I wanted to make the EK water block on the tough card look similar to the SE Founders Edition water block. Yeah, I, I would actually agree. It does look very similar, almost for a moment when I thought it was like, is that an FE card? But yeah, that's cool now that I know that. And I would definitely say that you did a fantastic job and I think tying in the overall aesthetic to make it look really nicely, man. So serious thumbs up there, really nicely done. Um, not overall a, th a theme, but you know, he wanted to have some similarity, um, you know, to bills that he saw online and, uh, you know, overall that he kind of really liked. And so I think you definitely hit the nail on the head there. He liked to try to clean up the cabling a little bit, maybe make a plate to hide some of the cables, maybe also add a drain valve. Yeah, I mean, drain valve is always important in a water cooling system. And maybe RGB fan to the PSU. That could be interesting, maybe add a little bit of spotlight effect, but you might be able to do that maybe if you could just angle in a clean strip as opposed to having to do it through um, something like a fan on the PSU, but there's definitely options right there. Um, he uses it for work, hobbies, video editing, 3D printing and gaming, and some of the games he plays, F1 Racing, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and Rust. And overall, 
Um, he just likes that Asus Mini ITX boards are built well. Um, got a thermal sensor that's built onto him, allows him to control the fan and the pump speed based on the water temperature. Um, and overall looks to be able to kind of give him uh, the foundation that he needs for a great water cooling build like this, man. So overall, kudos, John. Definitely uh, one of my favorite Mini ITX builds that I've seen here in a little while. So kudos, man. Very, very nicely done. All right, guys. I think we've got uh, two builds left here, and then we will be wrapping it up. So give me one second here. Yep, now we're getting back to Mike uh, originally that we talked about here. So we only got two images for Mike's system right here. So we got his setup shot. Nice little setup right here with dual monitors. Of course, you can see right there, he's got his microphone out there on the boom arm too. Um, and then we've got that system there in the corner. We pull back here and we actually take a look at the inside. We can see we've got definitely a serious water cooled box. Um, this is where I do think I'm torn. I, I might want... I really like a lot of times, I think like a distilled water or comes in like a mystic fog, but I think maybe pastels here might pop and punch a little bit more um, against a lot of the black that we have right here. And also, again, I'd like maybe horizontal base mounting because then we could see a little bit of that underfill lighting and create some dimension, but it still looks nice. Um, definitely don't get me wrong. I, th I think it's a, um, a nice looking system in terms of kind of water cooled setup, but I do think that maybe pastels could be interesting in adding in some contrast and some color play there. And secondary to that, like I said, I would have liked a horizontal just because I think that it would have give you a little bit more depth and dimension and maybe some bottom filled lighting that has a little bit more depth and play to it, but still looks quite nice. Um, looks like it's pretty clean, and well executed right there too. So let's see what you got going on there, man. Um, name of the system is Midnight Beast. Uh, three words to describe it, Beast, Stealth, and Wow. It's using an x 70 Dark Hero board, so a Crosshair board, 5900X, and a 2080 Ti, 32 gigs of RAM, and a 980 M.2 SSD, about 4,500 bucks. Um, he's most proud of the CPU and the motherboard pairing. Uh, it's overall black theme. Then if you nailed the black theme, I think you nailed it on the head then because it's definitely black. And the question is then, would you even want to go blacker, right, and actually maybe go with actually like a black, uh, pastel or something like that, right? Um, that could be kind of interesting to kind of really kind of go double down on that. And maybe, maybe even have like a UV element, which could be kind of interesting. Um, or go with like a strong, bold accent that might be um, another color, right? To kind of play around with that. I don't know. Either which way, I think it works really well. And definitely you've hit the, the theme on the head, um, but it's, it's a cool build, man. Um, anything he would change, he'd like to be able to upgrade to a 3080. Only took him 10 hours, man. Kudos. It's, it's pretty complex there. Um, gaming uh, is using primary use for the system. Apex Legends, some Destiny, Battlefield, and Rocket League. His favorite feature, dynamic OC switcher. Gets a thumbs up. That's a great way to be able to take your uh, Ryzen CPU to the next level, especially on the Dark Hero board. It's one of the best features on that. Um, overall, man, cool build, man. So kudos. Thumbs up there. All right. Uh, I think we, I might have one other build right here. Yes, I've got one other one right here. So give me one second to load this guy up here. This is from uh, Akim, I believe. Again, hopefully I'm saying your name right, Akim. Oh, cool. This is another small form factor build, Z11. So we got the RG Deltas up there. He's got in the vertical mount. Now you can do the Z11 horizontally or you can do it vertically. So you can do this chassis in either configuration. I like to see it in the horizontal configuration also gives you the best airflow but a lot of people like the vertical setup hey watcho hey thanks man you're catching us right here at the end of the stream we've just been going through our pc dad builder spotlight uh where we've been going through some awesome systems um that have been submitted by builders but uh let's go ahead and take a closer look here in terms of the setup We can see right there, he's got the setup right next to it. A little bit hard to kind of make everything out right there, but the z 11s right there next to it. You can see the deltas, and then of course his keyboard and mouse, and then of course the monitor, right? And here's all the hardware that went into the Z11. You can see the Z11 underneath the box, man. A true ROG fan, thank you so much for your passion, your enthusiasm, and your support, man. It's, uh, it's amazing, so thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and take a look right here. Uh, this was actually your first build, man. So kudos and congrats. Uh, it's a very cool build, especially for the first time. Um, name of the system is Seven. Uh, I wonder if that's named after one of the RG Worldview characters, right? Um, what would you uh, use three words to describe your system? Elegant, powerful, and unbeatable. Um, it's a Strix B550-I gaming. 
uh, motherboard, uh, a Strix 3070 Ti, Strix LC2 240 AIO ARGB cooler, and also a Strix 750 uh, power supply along with the, of course, Z11 chassis. Um, spent a little bit over about $3,100. Um, he's most proud that he was able to nail it and build an awesome ROG gaming build, and definitely you did that, sir. Um, his theme wanted to be ROG, ROG Strix, which he definitely did that. Um, he'd like to actually be able to upgrade the cooler and maybe go with like the Ryu Jin, which the Ryu Jin has the larger 3.5 inch uh, um, display on it, which I think it would look pretty cool. I think it looks very cool right now, but the cool thing about that display is of course, because you can customize, you could rotate it, you could center the frame a little bit more and maybe make it pronounced a little bit more. It took him about two weeks to build the system. He generally uses this for a rendering, uh, Photoshop, um, Twin Motion, AutoCAD, Illustrator, SketchUp. Actually, it sounds like you're doing a lot of work on it, man. So very cool. Um, I'd love to find out a little bit more about your workflow. He loves the fact that because as it's everything is ASUS and ROG, it all just works together and he can just control everything through Armory Crate. He doesn't have to use any additional applications. Um, overall, man, it's definitely a cool build, man. I like it. It's, it's nicely done. Yeah. Good job, man. Akeem gets a thumbs up, man. Um, I think that overall does wrap up our uh, PC DIY Builder Spotlight for this week. Let me just double check. We got Akeem here. Um, we got John Lee. We got Josh. We got Mike. Yep. All right. That covers us for everybody, guys. So that is going to be wrapping up this week's live stream. Uh, with that, guys, hopefully you guys are ending up your week on a positive and productive footing. Guys, stay safe. Stay healthy. Enjoy your weekends. Have a great uh have a great weekend and best wishes to you guys and yours. And if you guys have any questions, comments, feedback, feel free to go ahead and drop them. Whether you're checking us out on Facebook or where you're checking out us on YouTube, if you can, make sure to go ahead and drop us a subscribe, a like, a follow, a comment, whatever it might be. And if you guys want to find out more, uh, you have questions about ASUS hardware, uh, looking for insights into hardware, um, you know, uh, features, functions, designs, trying to figure out what to build, anything along those lines, feel free to go ahead and join us in our PC DIY Facebook group. It's linked in the chat. Um, if you're checking us out on Facebook or you're checking us out on YouTube, there's also uh, links in the description so you can join us there and you can feel free to tag me. I'm JJ. I'm the admin there. So with that, guys, take care. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day.